So I'd now like to introduce you, Dr. David Taylor. Um, David is the Vice President, Research for the ALS Asso Society of Canada. David studied biomedical toxicology before starting graduate work in ALS in 2001. After his PhD and two postdocs, yielding 10 first author publications in as many years, David joined ALS Canada in May 2012. David works to manage the ALS Canada research agenda by directing the strategic vision of the research program, delivering a comprehensive research grant program, including collaboration with Brain Canada and the federal government, identifying new sources of funding, facilitating new collaborations for our research community, profiling Canadian researchers, advocating for ALS with the federal government, and communicating ALS research in an, an understandable manner. He is very committed to the goal of making ALS research more accessible to clients, caregivers, donors, and the public at large, with the belief that this will create a positive feedback cycle where more funds are raised for researchers who in turn assist the fundraising public in feeling comfortable with the destination of their hard work and generosity. Please welcome David to give us an update on research. Thank you, David. Thank you. I, I've been warned to speak slowly, so I will try. I'm a very animated presenter. Um, thank you so much for this tremendous honor and pleasure to be able to present to you um, what I'm considering a, a 2016 global squared overview, global in terms of across the world and global in terms of concept. Um, so many of us remember where we were during moments in history, and I remember the morning of September 11th, 2001. I was a a young graduate student focused on toxicology, and I read my very first review article on ALS. And this was the article. And uh, from that day on, I've been hooked. Really wanted to be, I became very passionate about ALS. I really wanted to be a part of it when we could figure out how to make this a treatable disease. And uh, so what I'd like to do today is sort of take us through the entire sort of very brief history of ALS research in a short period of time to why I believe in 2016 it's really a tipping point as to where we are in making this a, a, a treatable disease. So over the 1950s through to the 1980s or so, there wasn't much we could do in ALS. A lot of it was observational and, you know, we found pockets of the world where there were a, a, a higher incidence of ALS-like conditions. Uh, Post-mortem tissue was examined by people like Hirano and Benina who came up with interesting observations, but we really didn't have a lot that we could do in the laboratory to study the disease. Um, there were also clinical trials that have been happening for decades, but in many cases they were just trying to put things that we surmised might be good for ALS into treating patients and seeing whether they had any outcomes. But one of the big breakthroughs that actually did happen over those earlier years were in the late 1950s when Len Curlin and Don Mulder realized that ALS could be passed on from parent to child in a small subset of the cases. And what this meant to scientists was, if we could identify one of these genetic causes of the disease, we would then be able to have a tool to work with in the laboratory to try to understand it. And so as many of us know, about five to 10% of the cases are familiar or hereditary in ALS. And the idea has always been that if we could use these genetic tools to understand the disease and understand why motor neurons degenerate, perhaps we would have treatments that could work for the entire uh, grouping of the disease, including the 90 plus percent that are sporadic disease. And finally, in the 1980s, we had the capability to be able to identify some of these disease-related ge genes. And um, in fact, through a sort of serendipitous uh, story, which I would love to get into, but I won't, r related to the Human Genome Project. 1993, we finally had a breakthrough, and the first genetic cause of ALS was discovered to be superoxide, dismuta superoxide dismutase 1, or SOD1. Now, at this point, we knew a lot about SOD1 in the field of research, and we thought, wow, it kind of makes sense. We may actually have a good shot at making this a treatable disease in the foreseeable future. However, it didn't quite work out because for the next 13 years, this was really our major tool to work with, SOD1. And one of the analogies I've been using in Canada for the past several years is that it was like trying to solve an extremely complex puzzle with one puzzle piece. Just not something that's very easy to do. So, however, after those 13 years, we finally had a breakthrough again in 2006 uh, with the discovery of something called TDP43. And this, in fact, uh, was found a couple years later to also be a second genetic cause of ALS. 
I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that also in 2006, right here in Ireland, there was another genetic cause that was discovered in 2006. But this really started what I consider to be the genetic renaissance or the genetic era of ALS because we finally started to have more of these tools. And conceptually, um, when we think about this as the puzzle piece again, and just using a few of the genetic cause of ALS, you can see that when we have more puzzle pieces, more ways of looking at this, suddenly it becomes a little more clear. We're gonna be able to understand this disease better. Now, looking ahead to 2011, as you can see, we started to have more of these tools to work with. And then if we look forward to um, 2015, for example, another few years after we had uh, the advancement of technology to find more of these genes, in fact, the number of genetic causes or genes that are related to ALS uh, is massively increased to a point that we don't have even the funding or the personnel to be able to study these um, in a way we would really love to. And certainly, um, these are all wonderful tools that we can use in the laboratory to study the disease. So if we think about this in a different way, um, if you take the four most prominently studied genetic causes of ALS, and we think about the fact that if we have a mutation in something called SOD1, it causes motor neuron degeneration through some biological mechanism. Same thing for FUS, same thing for TDP43, the same thing for C9 or F72. But what's interesting is that as, as we learn about each of these biological pathways that can cause motor neuron degeneration, we start to see commonalities between them that are gonna be good uh, places for us to target therapy. Furthermore, when you look at that list I just showed you of the different genetic causes that we do know, we start to add some of those in, we're gonna start to see whole systems within motor neuron biology and other cell types that are involved in ALS that are gonna be crucial spots for us to target therapies to slow down progression of ALS. And just to show you one last bit here, again, from those 13 years where we were working really hard on the SOD1 uh, pathway, we were really looking along this one pathway to motor neuron degeneration, and all of this was there, but we couldn't see it. So it's kind of like thinking we want to study the universe, but all we know at this point is that the world is flat and we have no telescopes. And all of that's out there, but we just can't see it yet. Uh, another thing that I should mention is that as we learn about ALS more and we see that there are potentially different subtypes of ALS, it might be that some of these genetic causes of ALS actually don't have a lot of overlap. And what we're getting to is an era where we might be able to do personalized medicine um, in a way where uh, certain types of ALS may be responsive to certain treatments and others uh, to other types of treatments. So looking back at this puzzle, the last thing I'm gonna show from this analogy I've been using, and what I'm excited to do is that in 2016, I think I'm ready to retire these slides a little bit, um, because, and you're gonna see why in a second. Um, one of the things I've been showing for the past few years is that some of these puzzle pieces have already been put together. And that's because over the years, we started to see that um, FUS and TDP43, for example, are both, both have common pathways that they work with in the biology. They're RNA binding proteins. However, if we look in 2016, and I started to go through years of articles to look at this, um, and we take a subset of the genetic causes that we now know for ALS, and we look at the connections that we have just in the past few years, it's a little more substantial than just a couple puzzle pieces put together. We're starting to see real commonalities between these different genetic causes of ALS. In fact, if we think about uh, certain systems that they're related to, one of them we started to see when more of these genes were discovered that they were RNA binding proteins. Um, a certain uh, substance or certain, a certain structure within our cells called stress granules that we've just started to learn more about in the last few years, a lot of the ALS genes are, re are related to stress granule formation. Something called autophagy, which is a recycling system in cells. We looked at that with SOD1 years ago and didn't find a lot of connection, and now we're actually seeing that a number of ALS genes are related to autophagy. Uh, the cellular batteries, mitochondria, a lot of the ALS genes are related to this. Um, and cellular trafficking. We've known for years that in fact TDP43 and FUS, which are two prominently studied causes of ALS, are actually found in an area where they're not supposed to be. So this might actually cause them to have toxic effects in that area of the cell where they're not supposed to be, and it may also reduce their ability to have their normal function in the place that they are supposed to be. So all of this tells us that there's a lot of trafficking differences that can happen in these cells where things are put, shuttled in and out of areas where they may or may not supposed to be. Furthermore, uh, other parts like the proteasome, which is a garbage system for the, for the cells, um, cytoskeletal, which is sort of the structural system, 
and uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which is another um, sort of structure within the cells that has a specific function, all of these show multiple ALS genes that are connected to them. So we're honing in and surrounding on the disease in a way that's going to hopefully make it treatable in the foreseeable future. Furthermore, we have a lot of different tools just in the last couple of years that we've never had before in terms of mouse models. This is sort of the, the pinnacle in terms of mammalian <laughs> models that we want to work with. Some of them are in process and some of them we've already got and have characterized. And 2016, as I'm going to show you in a moment, is sort of a banner year for where we've been in terms of development of mouse models in ALS. And just to show you that I'm not the only one thinking this way, this is a, a group from the Netherlands that published a paper this year looking at how uh, there are many things in common between the genetic causes of ALS that we've discovered just again in the last few years. And this one in, as well in 2015 is a paper where they discovered a new genetic cause called TBK1. And as you can see in this diagram, they've shown how they can connect this to the other known causes of ALS so that we can start to find those new targets for, th uh, for therapy. So getting granular now and really talking about what is happening in 2016, one of the things I, I did for this presentation is I went through the 1,300 abstracts that have been published this year to sort of pull out what, uh, what particular things I felt were really important. Uh, so I wanted to highlight those very quickly. One of the things I will say o on an overview on this is that in past years, in terms of the top journals where you see publications, Nature, Cell, and Science, uh, it was typically in ALS you'd see one, two, or three of these papers a year, and those would be really big findings. I find now they're coming out every few weeks, and that's pretty amazing uh, and really a testament to where the field is going. Um, one of the, the things that have been studied for a long time are mouse models of FUS and TDD43, but we have had a lot of trouble getting ones that have given valuable information. And so this year, there was a publication in Neil Schneider's lab which gave some more information about FUS mouse models, but I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, in the past few months we've had a very interesting uh, profilin-1 mouse model, which is another ALS gene that was discovered in 2012. Matron-3, another recently uh, discovered gene, has now got a mouse model that we can look into. Ubiquilin-2. Uh, CHAMP-2b, which is a uh, sort of understudied uh, particular uh, uh, gene for ALS. We now have a, an interesting mouse model to look into. And in 2015 and 2016, we have a number of C9 or F72 mouse models, and this is the most prominent genetic cause of ALS. So now we have a lot of different things that we can work with that we've never had before. Furthermore, C9 or F72 really took center stage in 2016. Um, I can remember in 2013, the very first paper that came out was something about the biological effects of this very important gene, and we're all very excited about it. Here we are three years later, and at the conference this week, I think it pretty much dominates the schedule in terms of what's being talked about. And we've seen that very crucial functions in ALS, like immune responses, inflammatory responses, um, uh, connections to stress granules, which is a connection to other ALS genes, and even novel ways in which we might treat C9 or F72 disease have all come to the forefront in 2016. Something else that's really been adopted I just realized now I'm not speaking very well into the microphone. <laughs> it's a little late to, to figure that out. Um, <coughs> in 2016, um, the field has really adopted the use of what are called IPS motor neurons. What this means is we can take cells from your skin of a person with ALS or the, a blood sample from people with ALS, turn this into stem cells, and then turn this into motor neurons or other cell types that are important in the disease. And Experts like Clive Svensson have been trying to determine how well this can represent human disease in a dish. And in 2016 has come up with some very interesting findings which tell us we need to continue to see how this can work and how um, uh, mature they might be, whether we need to think differently about how they're being used. Um, another thing that you'll see quickly when I get to the clinical side of things is that a lot of the targets for therapy that are currently in the clinical pipeline are aimed at something called microglia, which I consider to be the bouncers of the central nervous system. It's against inflammatory immune responses. But there's also another very important cell called an astrocyte, which I consider to be the motor neuron's sort of personal assistant cell. And uh, work by Brian Kaspar has been going on for several years and has finally come to fruition in 2016, which shows that we maybe have ways to target that therapeutically as well. 
Um, furthermore, one of the most prominent uh, 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 proteins in ALS is TDP43. It's actually got abnormalities in 98% of all ALS cases. And we found new and interesting ways in which we can connect that into the biology that we've not discovered before. And uh, something that's really come to the forefront in the ALS field in the last few years is work by J.P. Taylor and Steve McKnight, which has shown, in fact, that um, these RNA binding proteins and RNA, which are very highly connected into a lot of the genetic causes of ALS, can actually have a very weird phase transition is what we call it. So at some point, they're very soluble and you can't really see them. And if they get really close together, they can actually find, form these weird globules, sort of like oil and water. And if they get even closer together, they can become a solid and potentially toxic form. Um, and so all of this is sort of new to biology, and it's something that we really need to understand in order to not only understand ALS itself, but also to be able to target it for therapeutics. And uh, these two are really working on this uh, heavily, and we've had some very prominent papers in the Journal of Cell in the last couple months in ALS for this. And finally, um, is disease spread through what's called a prion-like mechanism? The, the idea here um, has been uh, sort of propagated by uh, Dr. Neil Cashman, for example, in Canada, Dr. David Borschelt in the United States, is that a misfolded protein might be able to contact a normally folded protein and cause it to misfold, and then potentially explain the spread of the disease as this continues through the body. And this is something that's been shown in cells, but hasn't been effectively shown uh, to be something that could potentially happen in living organisms like humans. However, in, this, uh, in 2016, we also had something that sort of showed this might be possible in a way in that these misfolded proteins might actually be sent out of cells and could potentially explain the spread throughout the body. More than anything, I think when I looked at all of those different abstracts is that there are really a lot of new potential therapeutic targets. And I think this really needs some way of collating all of this so we can find out what ones might be effective to move through to the clinical spectrum. And um, I won't get into this. This is something that was actually the highlight of last year's Orlando conference when I spoke to most scientists. It was worked by uh, someone named Bill Seeley, which actually was a very interesting case of somebody who uh, had a brain biopsy before the onset of frontotemporal dementia um, and ALS, and al ultimately um, was they were able to study both the postmortem tissue and the tissue ahead of time to be able to see temporarily how things were going with the pathogenesis of ALS. Furthermore, in 2016, there were a number of great articles, review articles, certainly with the speed at which things are happening in this field, it's important to have these to kind of bring it all together, and I urge anyone to have a look at these. Now, I know you had a, a, a presentation yesterday from Rob Goldstein about uh, precision medicine and big data. This is, you know, why I really also think 2016 is a big tipping point. Not only are we learning more about familial ALS in a way that could translate to sporadic ALS, we now have the capabilities to study human sporadic ALS directly. And I can't get into all of these because I, I, you, I'm sure you recognize a lot of these. Um, there are so many different consortia that are being built around the world to be able to study this and to get a signature of human ALS. And I think the key will be how can we combine the data from all of these different consortia to be able to get a, 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 a meaningful result in the end. And just to give you my sort of overview on what I think this means, uh, and the capabilities here is if you have someone who has ALS and you could take a simple blood sample from them or a skin sample, for example, first of all, we can turn those into stem cells and then turn those into any cell type that's important in ALS, oligodendrocytes, motor neurons, astrocytes, microglia, muscle cells, to be able to study them in a dish with the exact human genetic makeup of the person who donated it. Furthermore, there's something called omics, and then this could be an extensive talk all on its own. Um, whole genome sequencing, like Project Mine, if you've heard of this, uh, is a way of, of getting a genetic signature of a person's uh, um, entire three billion set of DNA. Uh, something called transcriptomics is how are their genes regulated up and down, for example, or even epigenomics, which tells us how the environment may influence how our genes are expressed up or down. Uh, so there's a lot of these different omics that will give us a specific signature about the disease. Furthermore, we can then complement that by doing what's called clinical deep phenotyping. So in fact, we can get as much clinical information on a person so that we can correlate that with what we see in the molecular biology. This includes things like high-powered imaging techniques. There are a lot of consortia around the world, many presenting this week, um, where they're looking at um, very strong techniques to be able to image the brain for earlier diagnosis and also to understand the disease as it progresses. Um, 
registries that allow us to ex examine exposures throughout people's lifetimes, like the one uh, uh, through uh, the CDC in the United States uh, can be beneficial for, for this. As I'm sure you heard yesterday, mobile um, wearable technology to be able to see how functional decline occurs over time, uh, like ALS-TDI is working on right now. And also, I, I believe you also heard about uh, app technology like the AB ALS mobile analyzer. We could use these types of data to plug into what we're seeing in the molecular uh, biology as well. Furthermore, we're learning every year more about how ALS connects to cognitive and behavioral impairment. And as tests evolve with that, we're going to be able to help to learn how that spectrum relates to what we're seeing in the rest of this. Um, things like Project Ambrosia in the UK, or I think you heard about Pulse yesterday in France, are, are taking biosamples like CSF and, and post-mortem tissue where you know, we're going to be able to also use that to correlate with all of this other information. Furthermore, uh, the microbiome is something that's being studied more in ALS and, and con a connection between the gut and the brain is something that's advancing as well. And finally, a database like PROACT database, which is how are people reacting to different clinical trials that they're on. And all of this being brought together to give a very complex signature for a person's ALS. And we're at a point now where something like IBM Watson or Google have the technology to be able to integrate all of this data. So it's a really great time that we're getting all of this data because we're going to start to have the ability and the computational capability to be able to make meaningful sense of it all. And once we get to that, that's also going to fuel um, the uh, preclinical research in terms of using animal models and cellular models to be able to go in then and find those distinct targets for therapy and actually make sporadic ALS a treatable disease. I'll quickly get into clinical trials because I'm mindful of your time, uh, but I think it is obviously very important. Um, one of the big things that happened in 2016 were the clinical trials guidelines that were updated, um, including the Alliance. There were a number of societies around the world that funded for the best ALS clinicians to get together in the United States in March um, to really um, come up with what is the best way that we should be designing clinical trials. Um, and this has been at the forefront of the field for the past several years, um, and in fact, um, one of the big key pieces is what, what are called biomarkers. I'm sure you've heard of these before. Um, and that addition is, uh, I believe, coming from two things that have been l sort of landmarks in the field in the last few years. The first one was uh, the largest ever clinical trial that happened in 2012 uh, by Biogen of a, a drug called Dexpramapexol. And um, when it failed to show any efficacy, the problem was we didn't know whether it was actually hitting the target that we suspected it would in humans. And, and with that case, we didn't know whether or not the target itself was no good or the drug was no good. So it was important for us to have some form of monitoring if it was hitting its target. Secondly, another drug called uh, NP001 from a company called Neuraltis. What they found is when they treated people, overall there was no change in their functional decline of ALS, but that a subset of people seemed to have no progression over a six month period and they termed those responders. And they've spent the last several years trying to figure out what would make a responder, and in fact found that they believe if you have an elevated level of something called C-reactive protein in your bloodstream, that in fact this would maybe potentially make you a responder. And now what I can say, we're, which is really exciting, MP001 is again in clinical trial, but they're pre-screening people for this biomarker to see if they might potentially be responders. So in terms of ALS, actually I think the most exciting thing that happened in ALS in terms of clinical trials was not actually in ALS. And um, spinal muscular atrophy is another motor neuron disease in children, and I'm sure many of you have heard that this summer, in fact, there was a drug called Nusinersen, uh, or sorry, a therapeutic called Nusinersen by a company Biogen that actually was stopped mid-clinical trial because of the success of the trial. And so much so that now they've, they've not only put it forward for approval, but have also put forward expanded access for people to get it, um, access to this treatment because it's the children were actually meeting milestones of normal children uh, in this trial. And this is a very debilitating disease in young children. Furthermore, uh, work by Dr. Jerry Mendel and, and Brian Casper at Ohio State University found that a single in intravenous injection of something called AAV9, that's the name of the, the virus, that actually produces a gene that can help children and is showing clinical efficacy um, is another potential mechanism in which we might be able to treat SMA. So here we are, a disease that maybe five or six or seven years ago, we were just where we are in ALS right now, and it seems quite promising that there's some very strong potential to make this a treatable disease.
One other disease that I think is important to note um, in terms of ALS for two different reasons is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is a debilitating disease in young uh, children, mostly boys, um, where they're lacking something called dystrophin in their muscle. And something called Exondice 51, in fact, was shown in 13%, so a specific form of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 13% of, of these children to have an increase in the dystrophin levels. And even just based on that, not based on any efficacy for the disease itself, um, the FDA actually put this forward for accelerated approval. Um, and so this actually impacts ALS in two ways. First of all, we may be a disease where we see something like MP001, where only a subset of people may be treatable at first, uh, based on the therapy. And secondly, it shows that um, bodies like the FDA, the European Medicines Agency, are gonna be more flexible moving into the future when it comes to uh, diseases with unmet needs. In terms of clinical trials, uh, I think in phase one and ones that are coming down the pipeline, I've never been so excited about the types of things that are being tested. Um, I won't go into any of these in major detail. One of them is a copper supplement actually being tested in Australia. Had some, uh, some really crazy preclinical data where a type of mouse that died from motor neuron disease in 40 days, the ones that were treated with this lived for 300 plus days. Um, something we've never seen before, and it was first, I think, uh, discussed here at this meeting two years ago in Belgium. Um, some new stem cell therapeutics, uh, Nicholas Maragakis's work in the, in the United States with Q Therapeutics, and, and Clive Svensson's work in, in California are coming forward to clinical trial. Um, and just a number of different things, uh, but I think the key piece here is at the bottom that now based on all the great preclinical work that's happening in ALS, you have a number of companies that are eyeing the disease with potential therapeutics to come into the pipeline. In terms of phase two, um, something you're going to hear about if you're here for the research forum at the opening session, uh, Dr. Richard Bedlack is looking at something called Lunacin and his uh, ALS reversals. This is a way of taking something that ALS Untangled saw anecdotal evidence in and tried to put it into uh, a more formalized version of a clinical trial and a very unique one. Brainstorm, I'm sure many of you heard about. We could do a talk on Brainstorm all on its own just based on the, uh, the, the, uh, the series of events that have happened over the years with Brainstorm. But I think the piece that's important here is that this year we got results in the summer from a, a, a phase two trial which happened at three sites in the United States and did show promising data um, in terms of wanting it to go forward to the next phase. Um, I already talked about MP001. There's also Actemra, which is a rheumatoid arthritis drug. Ritigabine, which is something that had intriguing data in the preclinical uh, sense before going to clinical trial. And maybe you've also heard of a Daravone, which is a, uh, a free radical scavenger that is actually approved in South Korea and Japan. Um, and they're now pending as to whether or not they would run clinical trials in Europe and the United States. I think the big one, though, is that 2017, we are actually poised to potentially have two drugs that could be submitted for approval for ALS. Um, first of all, I'm sure as everyone knows, cytokinetics has been uh, amazing to this community. Uh, and we're finally at a point where tiraceptiv is gonna be uh, determined whether or not this will be effective for ALS, uh, particularly in slowing down breathing, uh, uh, the, the, the dysfunction in breathing. Uh, and finally, also AB Science is something that came to the forefront in 2016 with a drug called mesitinib that is actually based around um, some inflammatory responses. And they had preclinical data published in 2016 which showed if they treated a very aggressive ALS mouse after the onset of disease, which would be similar to what we would see in humans at this point, it actually slowed down progression of the disease. And even more exciting, interim results from their phase three clinical trial of 400 patients in fact showed that there was a slowing down of the disease on all metrics. And so, so much so that the European Medicines Agency has already had a filing of mesitinib uh, for uh, ALS uh, pending the results that will occur or will finalize in, in, in the next few months. So that's very exciting news. Um, mindful of your time, last slide here before I get into one quick analogy is that as much as the biology has come a long way, the technology has really allowed us to move forward. The cost of things has come down so that we can do that type of um, precision medicine that I was talking about before. We have technology now like CRISPR-Cas9 that five years ago I would have thought was science fiction where we could actually go into a living cell or a living organism and change a mutation. And we don't yet even know what the, the full implications of our, that are, but it was really developed in really late 2013 and now is fully adopted in almost all of the applications I see at the preclinical pre level. 
Ways in which we can uh, uh, give gene therapy treatment have advanced massively. Uh, for example, AAV9 with a single IV injection is showing clinical relevance in children. Optogenetics, we have ways in which light responsive molecules can actually potentially bypass the need for a connection between our brain and our muscles. Uh, and Linda Greensmith in the UK is doing a lot of work with that. And many of you may have seen that a New England Journal of Medicine paper that was published a few weeks ago is sort of like the first home computer version of, uh, of an implant where someone can actually think someday, I'd like to turn the lights on or off and the lights will go on and off. And so that is really moving forward as well. So not only is it about therapeutics, but also finding better ways to give quality of life to those who have ALS. And furthermore, the computing capabilities and artificial intelligence are continually moving forward to a point where I think we're gonna make this treatable in the foreseeable future. So I wanna leave you with one last silly analogy here to sum it up. I've always believed that ALS is very complex. It's like inside this very difficult fortress. And for many, many years, all we could do was sort of look in there and say, I think this is how we can break down those walls. And we had some clinical trials, but they were completely misfiring, nowhere near it. For, for 13 years, this is when I was doing my PhD, I remember it sort of as the dark ages because we were working with one particular person who was trying to smash down that wall. And we tried really hard um, and we had some clinical trials going on, but this is really what it felt like when we were going at that wall to try and break it down. For another five years, um, uh, we ended up starting to get a few breakthroughs. We had a few better things that we could work to try and attack that wall. Um, but again, still, we weren't quite there. I think one of the pieces was we now had the technology to recruit many of these tools to be able to work on this fortress. And now, this is where it gets exciting. If we think about 2016 and where we're at, this is what our army looks like now. Although, wait, for the last few years, things have come so far that the army really kind of looks like this because we've now Put, we've, we've trained them, we've made them working better together. Our clinical trials have gone from this in the last few years to this, so I think we have a much better shot. We've actually found some weaknesses in the wall. Mesitinib, Tiracemtib, we think are some potential breakthroughs in 2017. We have ninjas now. Um, if certain technology that we can sneak inside and actually attack ALS in a different way than we've ever been able to before. Precision medicine is gonna give us the blueprints to the fortress, and we have the computing capabilities to actually understand those. Something I didn't talk about that's equally important as therapy is being able to diagnose the disease earlier, and there are a number of efforts underway to finding out ways to diagnose earlier, including some of those precision medicine efforts uh, like Pulse and like uh, uh, Project Ambrosia. And finally, we're getting more exposure in ALS, which certainly don't have the funding we need to make this treatable, uh, but with, ice, with the ice bucket challenge, with more philanthropy and people seeing that they can make a difference with their dollars at this particular moment, we are on our way. And something we've been saying in Canada is that um, treatment for ALS is a matter of when, not if at this point, and that when depends on funding. So don't take it from me, Oh, sorry, I forgot my big thing is that if we came that far in four years, I really believe we have a shot in another four years of making significant damage on making ALS a treatable disease. And don't take it from me, here's something that was published in a review article just a couple months ago by three very prominent gentlemen in the ALS field, two of them who have been in it for many years and they don't use their words lightly. And let me just say here at the end of the article, it says looking forward, and this to me is amazing, Last, and perhaps most importantly, there will be considerable achievements in the development of therapies of ALS. That's pretty amazing to me, having this person be the person I read the first article from 15 years ago, and it was nowhere like that kind of hope. So, thank you very much. This is us in uh, Toronto. We have a new office downtown. We're really excited about it. Please visit us. We love the city, and thank you so much for uh, having me.